everyone, Brian Beeler, and thanks for checking out the podcast. We've got an interesting conversation today coming up uh, with Dell Technologies. They've taken their first storage system and ported it to the cloud. And I'm sure Michael's cringing at me already by calling it a storage system and, and, and porting it. But basically, PowerFlex OS is now available in AWS as part of Dell's project Alpine, which is uh, making all of their storage system softwares available in the cloud. So Michael, what, what have I done wrong to, to uh, bristle you already? Yeah, that's all right. Hey, Brian, thanks for having me here. <laughs> I, I appreciate you giving us some time. Um, the role I play here for our team is on the product management side for our primary storage team. I lead advanced planning and product strategy initiatives that are often aligned with the things that are emerging for us in this industry and for the Dell primary storage products. Uh, PowerFlex has its genesis from being, first of all, software defined from the very beginning. Uh, Dell and EMC through the acquisition of EMC acquiring uh, power, I'm um, sorry, Scale.io. Scale.io is the genesis of what we are talking about here. So this has been through many, many, many iterations of uh, maturity. Uh, the uh, genesis of this product has always been software defined. It's always been cloud enabled. So this is just about basically enabling us to provide a validated deployment mechanism that happens to be on the cloud. They offer physical x86 platforms and this runs on virtually any kind of x86 infrastructure without specialized hardware required. Yeah, I mean, we we saw Scale.io, and, and you and I talked in Vegas at, at AWS's event, we saw Scale.io at near the very beginning from them, and it was really great, one of the best software-defined solutions we had ever seen, and still today, I think is one of the most comprehensive in that you can run it in a variety of different ways. You can run it in a hyper-converged, and they were doing that with four node 2U systems before hyper-convergence was even really popular and, uh, and, and in vogue. And then it can also be run just as a standard storage uh, array at, is, uh, as PowerFlex. So it, you know, I, I think it's, it's one of your neater offerings, but it also makes sense. Um, I mean, we talked to, uh, to Caitlin back at uh, Dell Tech World about what you guys were doing with Alpine. Flex is, is, of all of them, probably the easiest since it was already disaggregated from hardware. It was already standalone. You guys were running it on PowerEdge servers and, and other things, but probably the easiest to go take that and put it in AWS. How much work was required on the code base, if any, to make that happen? Yeah, so that was the remarkable part of this was that we didn't do your your word porting to get this to work in a public cloud environment. So AWS being a market leader in this platform of infrastructure as a service offers the necessary ingredients that we fundamentally need. We need x86 processors, we need a proper network. And in this case, we have a data store options that can leverage either the local instance stores where we can federate the necessary NVMe media together to form the cluster, or we can use EBS as a data store as well. Uh, in this case, there was no code change necessary for us to make that happen. So the version that we ship to our customers that takes the form of an engineered system that runs on a PowerEdge server equally operates on the exact same code base without any changes to it uh, on AWS. Uh, we use instance stores and or EBS for the construction of that. Um, we can grow that cluster from anywhere from three to over 512 nodes. Uh, we scale to over 2000 compute nodes that interface with that in a two layer or what you would call in your description, a disaggregated form. So the two of those ingredients working together produce millions of IOPS and extremely high throughput uh, you can imagine might be very necessary for workloads that need to go from potentially just starting off with maybe a, a dev or test environment to a full-blown production deployment. Uh, being able though, to asymmetrically scale either the storage or the compute has been extremely important to our customers on-prem and in this case now in the cloud. So you, I don't want to drive past this notion of, of how storage is allocated, because if we think about flex on uh, PowerEdge, typically will be, I don't know, say it's just a 2U 24-base server. Each one of those SSDs adds incremental performance benefit to the system as you load them into the system and, and generate the performance gain from having more drives available to you, more nodes than more drives, et cetera. Uh, in the cloud case, 
You've done something that's pretty interesting here, that I think, as we've talked through it prior, in, in how you uh, collect and aggregate the storage. So you said uh, EBS or EC2 storage that's NVMe attached local, but uh, talk through that in a little more detail, if you would, about how customers can leverage Amazon's existing resources to let you still get the performance and or the economics you want out of Flex in, in AWS. Yeah, exactly. Um, so if you take the analogy of a power edge based server where the NVMe media is installed on the server, we add more and more nodes, you add more and more capacity. With that, you incrementally add more IOPS, more throughput. What you don't add is latency. So these are sub millisecond uh, mission critical workload uh, types of environments. Uh, the same exact environments are there on the AWS platform. Uh, the EC2 instances that are available with NVMe media are clustered by us in exactly the same way. Uh, we federate all of the capacity. You're adding more IOPS, you're adding more uh, throughput, you're not adding latency to this. Um, one of the differentiating elements of doing that though, isn't just being able to cluster the nodes, but to be able to use something in PowerFlex we call fault set architectures. On-prem, you would have been looking at this as, hey, I wanna make sure that I have a means of protecting a rack if I do lifecycle management and I need to bring a rack down. Uh, I have the rest of the racks in my in a data center to take over uh, for what's going on when I'm doing that administrative event. Uh, it might be if you actually had though something unintentional, such as a failure of something that uh, unlikely occurs, but in the event that you had a rack outage, the fault set architecture takes over for all of the nodes in all of the drives. And uh, think about how dramatic that has to be in terms of being able to keep up also with the performance. And in the cloud environment, that fault set architecture translates to an availability zone. So with three or more availability zones, we can stretch essentially the cluster of all of these nodes across that multiple AZ environment. And in doing so, what we have not done is created a replication of two or three X, like you might see some alternatives in the marketplace do. Um, what we're able to do is still federate all of those nodes in all of the EZs and still provide a federation of all of the capacity that's presented by all the nodes in all of those EZs and federate the performance and throughput with low latency. So there's an example of something that we already had in the product, already was designed because the software-defined capabilities allowed us to take advantage of this in the cloud. So again, without having to change the core function of the product, the hero functionality of this fault set architecture mapped extraordinarily well into the concept of a multi-AZ implementation in a cloud environment. So for those that don't know, an availability zone is in, in AWS parlance, is that the same as like US East and, and West, uh, or are there multiple availability zones within a physical location? How does that work? Yeah, no, they're, they're not um, uh, regional. So what you just referred to there would be regional. So within a region though, there are multiple availability zones. They are in proximity to one another, typically within 30 miles of each other on AWS's case. <clears throat> and what we're able to do is take advantage of their uh, very high speed connections between those AZs um, with the advantage of how PowerFlex works and taking advantage of all of those nodes that are across those availability zones. And they're having low latency connections, high bandwidth connections between them. We're able to take advantage of all of the things I mentioned about those fault set architectures. Now with that though, we do have an asynchronous replication product functionality uh, in the offering. And what that allows you to do is incorporate a BCDR, a business continuity or disaster recovery architecture, which could take the form of one region to another, uh -huh. uh, where we have a, a up to 15 second RPO time. Uh, so again, world-class capabilities in terms of being able to do something that should a disaster event occur, you have an ability to quickly uh, get back to production uh, workloads. And um, I, I failed to mention earlier that with that AZ protection mechanism, should an AZ outage occur, this is without disruption to the workload or what the workload sees as available uh, performance. So we may detect that within four seconds or so that there is some disruption that's occurred. All of the automation in the product takes a, a look at what's going on from those uh, AZ or node outages uh, takes over 
uh, for reprotecting it and rebuilding that without disruption to your production environment. In the case of the replication, I just want to add that one of the options might be from on-prem to cloud uh, as a mechanism to use our replication as well. So let's stick on this AZ thing for a minute because I think the resiliency benefits here are pretty important. If you wanted that level of resiliency on-prem, how much infrastructure would be required for that? Because it, at a certain point, it would become untenable, wouldn't it? Um, I, I think what you're asking is you, you're, you're dealing with something that's going to end up with a multi-rack configuration, which is not an uncommon deployment uh, okay. scale that our customers are using for for PowerPlex. But the um, AZ, the AZ, multi-AZ though gets you some physical separation, which may be harder to do on-prem, right? Yeah, I mean, certainly uh, when we look at a three AZ, uh, you know, having a, a three node in, in three different AZs and a total of, in this case, nine to just use that example, sure. very reasonable thing to separate in the AWS environment. Would you build a rack one at a time with only three uh, compute nodes in, in it and, and physically separate them? That's probably not as likely as you would okay. fill up a rack and have multiple racks in a data center, in which case using a AZ would be for a, a large deployment. And, and that's just because of what it is capable already of doing. Um, Dell Digital here, our own uh, infrastructure is heavily uh, deployed on any major database that you can imagine today that's uh, on the planet is used by Dell for our own infrastructure and our uh, primary deployment for mission critical applications is using PowerPlex. So this is a good point and, and probably uh, we should have done this a little bit at the beginning. You know, sometimes you know, I get locked in and, and you and I have talked already quite a bit so, so we know each other. But for those that don't know PowerFlex, let's take one giant step back and talk about how PowerFlex is differentiated in the portfolio that has other uh, unstructured offerings. So maybe just look at, the, at, well, I don't know, you do it how you want to do, but uh, talk to us a little bit about where Power, PowerFlex sits within the broader Dell storage portfolio. Sure, so if you look at where we are servicing multiple primary storage uh, segments, uh, you have Power store and our product there has been market leading in servicing a lot of the customers who are looking for uh, our mission critical mid-market uh, storage products. Um, PowerStore is phenomenal in its eclectic ability to do block and file capabilities. Um, very, very easy for customers to uh, implement and it has been a logical progression as we've consolidated our portfolio to make things simpler for our customers to understand. Uh, PowerMax for our ultra high-end customers, PowerMax being the ultra of people who are looking for the, the uh, uh, bulletproof mechanisms for relying on mission critical applications. PowerFlex here to offer our customers some combination of those where we're able to help with people who might want to modularly scale. As they say, we started with three nodes on a, a cloud infrastructure. Uh, On-prem, we typically start with somewhere around four, um, but we can grow that implementation as customers need and do it very modularly. So if um, there's an unpredictable amount of capacity that's needed, then great option here is for people to be able to store uh, uh, add more uh, modularly. Now, because this is a product that's capable of full stack implementation, uh, when we deliver an on-prem infrastructure, our engineered systems are inclusive of everything, right? So the, uh, the, the nodes that deliver the storage, the nodes that are delivering the compute, the networking all come together as an ingredient set that is oriented towards what we do when we go through our customer conversations, and that is, what is our, what's your problem that you want to solve? What are the implementation objectives? Uh, what are the applications that you're trying to deliver? We spend a tremendous amount of our roadmap all the time on working out how to best architect for certain workloads. We've got a tremendous arsenal of white papers that talk about what the results will be if you're looking for any type of application uh, containers virtual machines, uh, bare metal, our ability to mix and match those is a tremendously valuable part of this because it makes it a bit future-proof. Um, <clears throat> not knowing how much of your deployment might change from being VM-based and to potentially bare metal containers 
and that's a trend that is taking place here, sure. might be something that you're not quite sure how fast or how much you're going to need. But a non-disruptive option is to use something like PowerPlex. You've got an ability to run the workloads on the compute side. You've got the storage to keep up with whatever that is. And to do those things asymmetrically um, means that you're not going to over-provision one or the other. We can, as you mentioned earlier at your introduction, do hyper-converged where it might make sense initially if somebody was starting off knowing what their ratio is of compute to storage, great place to start. I want to add more compute, great. We can add more nodes that do just the compute. If you needed more storage, we can add more nodes that add more storage without disrupting anything that they already invested in. So the ability for us to combine hyper-converged two layer, which we call two layer by having separate compute and storage. They're, they're not siloed so that you have to start one over again. Uh, all of these are mixable and matchable. Um, you hit on a couple things. Draw me a parallel or, or differentiation real quick between in the unstructured world for what you can do with Flex versus power scale. Sure. Um, in PowerScale, you're doing something similar, which is that you're adding file services as a node by node expansion needs to occur. Uh, very, very much so an important part of what people might well, be more familiar with as Isilon. Uh, mm -hmm. PowerScale is now, now that brand name for Isilon. Um, and what we have done here is essentially that for block storage. Now, in what we have done recently in our version of 4.0 of PowerFlex is we have added transactional NAS as a controller mechanism in this as well. So using the powerfulness of that extensible block, end, block storage as a backend, uh, we can add NAS controllers to this that scale from two to 12 nodes. Uh, that adds the capability for this to be a multi-element product with the scalability, as I mentioned, 512 nodes of block storage can be back-ended by these 12, two to 12 nodes of NAS controller functionality as well. Okay. Okay. That's helpful. I mean, you've got a lot there and, and that's even a consolidated portfolio <laughs> from where you guys were, uh, I don't know, 24 months ago, right? So that's, uh, that's pretty good. A lot of those have added up over the years with the acquisitions and, and everything else. Um, so, this has been with early customers for a little while, I assume, the AWS version. And I know it's consumable in the marketplace, so that'll be um, how customers go to get started. But what have you seen in early customer adoption or use cases? Where are you seeing some trend lines uh, with with kind of the early returns on, on uh, Flex on AWS? Yeah, so as, as customers look at what they think they hear, and that is storage, or they hear block storage, there's um, almost an immediate assumption that everything that they've been used to using with enterprise class storage on-prem is there for them to use elsewhere. Um, <clears throat> what we are providing customers is that transition to make that a seamless and a equivalent type of experience is what they've been used to using in an on-prem environment. So some of these mission critical workloads or all of these mission critical workloads that need to get to the kind of scale that we can provide is the value add that working with Amazon that we provide. Um, the ability for us to give people basically this elasticity of modular growth, the ability for us to deliver these extremely high performance workloads, the um, ability to show proven outcomes that keep up with what they may have been doing when they were doing something with us on-prem and doing now so with a, a public cloud environment uh, is allowing us to show that there's now this extensibility that both can be, hey, I want to go to using a cloud for some portion of my infrastructure. I have a hybrid use case. I started to say earlier that the ability to do replication to a cloud environment is something that somebody may choose to do for if something were to go wrong, a BCDR environment uh, might be for test and dev, and I've got to have something that works the same exact way as it will on-prem because I might do the dev and test there because I need instant gratification. My developers expect me to not say, I've got a PO in and I've got three or four months for you to wait before I get more gear in here, but rather to give them instant gratification, a uh, benefit of the cloud is doing exactly that. How do I help them with a uh, internal as a service for something that's literally as quick as you can respond to a trouble ticket to deploy what they need to do that uh, dev and test work and then come back maybe do the deployment the other though is if i do need to uh, deploy a mission critical workload i need this thing to be able to do what i expect and that's i need this to be resilient so therefore why the value of that multi-az environment 
if I need to be capable of doing something that's literally bulletproof in terms of the, the uh, functionality I mentioned earlier of being able to do region to region uh, replication uh, also is the kind of thing that people are expecting that they're going to have that they were used to using all along on on prem. Um, the databases are often the things people are gravitated to using in our environment, in a cloud environment. Uh, hmm. Being able though, to run any combination of those that might be containerized or what you'd consider conventional uh, databases uh, and mixing and matching those. Uh, so a particular uh, client of ours is set up to do basically uh, a database as a service internally, right? So they're trying to service their developers needs for being able to run literally any kind of environment and do it quickly and, and deploy it without uh, uh, going through any kind of physical transformation uh, is extremely valuable. Well, um, let me ask you about the database examples specifically because Amazon's actually done a pretty good job of developing uh, instances and offerings around database. And I know there's always gonna be overlap with your services as Dell and theirs and yours on theirs and all this sort of thing, right? Uh, but what does, uh, what does PowerFlex in the cloud get you in terms of running those applications versus uh, running them on, on services that Amazon provides? Yeah, so certainly you understand if there's a database that's running on infrastructure that's set up with ingredients that Amazon provides, um, then that's what you're going to have as a substrate under which those services are rendered. Um, in what we've done here with this multi-AZ, with the scalability getting you to literally any capacity that you want, uh, the ability for you to grow this and to deliver the sub-millisecond latency performance envelopes that I mentioned earlier, uh, makes it an extremely attractive option, not to necessarily compete with AWS, but rather complement what it is that they can do for their customers whole point is to be able to have a way of um, eliminating any obstacles that customers may feel that they have. Um, if they've gone through something that was maybe uh, um, less performant than they had expected, rather than uh, regressing back to doing something that old way, then this would potentially be there for them to continue to, to work through and work with our partnership with, with Amazon. Uh, they're very familiar with what we have been putting together here. We've partnered now here for quite some time. And as a result, um, they're very impressed with the outcomes that we've been able to demonstrate um, to the degree of some of this being uh, almost unbelievable. If you think about what we've talked about here on this call, the ability to get to that um, uh, distributed scale out uh, mechanism uh, it is truly remarkable. So all the work you're doing now is with existing customers, right? Uh, existing, well, I don't want to assume, are they all existing PowerFlex customers? Or do you have some customers that, that are, you know, big Dell shops that are saying, I've really been waiting for this and now you've given me access to, you know, a beta version of it and, and now I want to jump in and try. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, uh, have you had yeah, any of that? It's a combination. Certainly those customers that are very familiar already with using PowerFlex in an on-prem environment are, are, are faced sure. with a, hey, I would like to be able to use more flexibility a cloud environment offers. Why vacate one to go to the other? Rather, why don't I tie the two of those together? Uh, this is certainly causing, as a part of our announcement earlier this year, of Project Alpine, uh, net new customer interest in what it is that we're able to do that uh, frankly, we, we, they've not seen being capable of uh, uh, being satisfied with other options before. Um, so whether they are PowerFlex customers or not is less important than the fact that most customers in the world are somehow working with Dell in some capacity anyway. So what this is doing is helping to broaden the addressable opportunity space um, and to help customers with some things that they may have found to have been a little bit encumbering in terms of how to get to what they wanted to get uh, out of doing something with a transition like this. You've talked a lot about um, the large scale opportunities for mission critical apps. Do you see how small, and I know you've talked about three nodes and, and that's a common building block for the cloud deployment, but how small do you see these going and is there an edge play here that makes any sense or or do you have you know feelings that 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 maybe there are other dell products that are a better fit there i'm just sort of thinking about as as we look at where data is being created we're seeing more infrastructure physically being driven to those locations but some of that could be 
cloud driven too, I suppose, or or some sort of hybrid. Do, yeah. What do you is it too early or or what are you seeing there? Yeah, uh, uh, there's a couple of ways to answer that. So uh, first of all, there's usually some aspect of uh, conversation with the customer first about it, where are you going. So starting off with something as small as that three node configuration may be the appropriate step that they want to take because they're looking for something that helps them with the performance. So just to give you some idea, with this view is like four nodes, we're over a million IOPS. Now, do you need that amount of performance? If you do, then that's a frankly unmet need that we help fill in that is important. But also if they're in a state of, let's see how this goes for an initial deployment, then that might be the first step. If that's all they want to begin with, then they may be perfectly happy with the offerings that uh, primary storage from uh, Amazon offers, such as EBS, in the form of the various uh, IO2, IO1 uh, options. If that's fine, and you know, we're not here to displace the existing met needs. We're here to help with these uh, needs that customers may not find uh, are going to keep up with the pace of change. And that's where the next step would be is where do you want to go? And if part of the conversation is, look, we're, we're, we're starting off at this point, what we need to get here, and this is the growth trajectory that we're on, then this would be a non-disruptive way to get there. As I say, adding node by node what you need, add compute nodes, add storage nodes, being able to put them together in that asymmetrical manner is a perfect example of how customers will try and make sure that they don't outgrow something or in this case match better what the cost is for the workloads that they need instead of overspending to start off with something that might not necessarily be fully utilized for some time. Um, as far as ed edge implementations go, one of the things that you've seen us do is qualify with the uh, with um, uh, the EKS Anywhere option. So um, uh, the Amazon option for people who are saying, I want to do containers, I'm picking the distribution from Amazon. EKS Anywhere is an outstanding platform for me to use. Um, I'd like to be able to use it on a PowerFlex implementation. And that's because I need on-prem proximity to where the workloads are occurring. I need the responsive, the latency. I need to be able to expand this similar to what our existing on-prem customers are doing today. Then this is an excellent story for people who are looking for, again, some hybrid mechanism. They prefer to use an Amazon distribution of their Kubernetes options. Um, there would be uh, extensibility future conversations here about what Outpost potentially could be doing in this environment as well. Uh, well Out, Outpost is another interesting angle. Uh, I, I often lament the lack of hardware at AWS reInvent, but Outpost always comes through in the uh, the snow devices um, uh, are, are always there in no snow, no snowmobile this time, or at least not that I saw, but the, the snowball and, and snow cones. They, the, they, didn't uh, the, they didn't have the dunk tank this year. Uh, the previous, <laughs> previous years, they had the uh, the rainstorm going inside of the little uh, container with the with the snowball inside of it. So, yeah, those those things are neat. And actually, we did uh, a, a podcast on just snow uh, a couple times ago. So, for anyone that is super into uh, those products, check that out. Um, yeah, the uh, outpost angle is interesting. Maybe we'll we'll come back to that. The um, listening to you talk about the use cases, though, it's got to be exciting because there's so many, but also challenging because there are so many. And it's really hard, uh, I think, for for Dell to take and communicate to the market what PowerFlex on AWS is capable of because it's it's, you know, maybe so broad. I mean, that's got to be a challenge. How do you maintain the ability to do so much for so many different use cases, but check that against ease of use, ease of deployment, ease of management, because that's the cloud's got to do both, right? And exactly. And if you think about what the cloud has been leveraged by many organizations to do, it's um, the instant gratification, the I can procure what I need now um, and I can do so with the intent of being able to deliver some outcome to my business. I mean, and that's really what both we and Amazon very much are focused on is how do we address customer needs? How can we be there and help the customers with their uh, future direction? So, yes, the diversity of what we can do um, is very much oriented those towards those mission critical applications. Uh, we're here to help customers with sustaining something that's got an important sensitivity to conducting transactions typically for their organizations. 
um, being able to provide insight that helps them run their businesses more efficiently, um, being able to do so with the type of performance and levels that we can achieve here are all, I think, the kinds of things that customers are always going to continue to care about. I mean, why is it block storage? It's block storage because those are the ones that are servicing these most um, performance sensitive use cases. Um, if all we did was provide something that was quote unquote, like you said, ported to uh, a cloud environment, <clears throat> we might not have necessarily been very optimal. But in this case, that was not uh, a necessary step. Our, our whole platform has been designed from the very beginning uh, to be scale out and a performance is the design tenant that's most critical to what we deliver. Um, being able to do this modularly, being able to do it asymmetrically with the compute and storage separately, all have been uh, important for those kinds of workloads that you're asking about. So yes, there's a diversity to that. And that's why the, the, the type of white papers that we publish very regularly here are trying to help people understand that we've already been through it. We've here, we're here to show you that you're not the first ones to do these things. These are the outcomes you can expect. Give them some expectations of performance levels per node. Uh, the, the things that we've shown is that the uh, performance levels are not just good, they are a very important cost savings because the level of performance that we can achieve with relatively few nodes uh, is a testament to efficiency. Hmm. Um, we didn't cover this previously, but some of the important parts of the data services that are in what we deliver on PowerFlex, especially in a cloud environment, uh, are, are important for customers who are looking for not only performance, but some uh, a cost savings. So uh, we're able to help our customers go through a profile conversation, explain to them how is it that we can reduce what they're spending. Um, it's a very unusual circumstance for me in product management to have the ability to say good, fast, cheap, pick three. Uh, we've got the very, very important part of this equation that people always will care about, and that is, is it going to be good, but is it cost effective? And the answer is yes, absolutely. And we're more than happy to discuss that as part of how we profile customers and help them with their journey towards this direction. So you brought up another thing that reminded me, um, we, we talked about lifecycle management a little bit, but also let's talk about um, operating system software management a little bit in terms of power uh, flex. So on prem, you're releasing updates on a pretty regular cadence, right? That's correct. Yes. Yeah. And obviously we're keeping up with things that have to do with our software defined ingredients. We're helping customers as they need to go through updates that may be at the hypervisor level. Um, also obviously the physical layer. So the whole engineered system experience for PowerFlex, when we deliver something that's Power Edge based, is not just saying we take care of only one layer, but the entire stack. Uh, so right. all the way from the BIOS or IDRAC level on up uh, is how we treat the system when we say we deliver an engineered experience. So how, how, how does that parallel to the cloud? So when you have a PowerFlex OS update, is there some lag to make that available to AWS customers? How, how does that work? Yeah, it's the same code. So the same version, same updates to it. Um, there's less things that we have to physically manage because obviously in the case of AWS, um, they're in charge of what needs to happen for the physical layer. Uh, right. uh, all the way up to inclusive of the, the Nitro-based infrastructure, which is where you're hosting your virtualization layer. Many people probably don't maybe pay too much attention to hypervisor enablement when you're dealing with an AWS environment because frankly, you do have um, that already built in. Um, that's fine. We are uh, uh, agnostic to the virtualization layer. Um, and that may be an important point that we didn't cover here, but we don't require and nor do we need to use the bare metal instances that Amazon offers. And why am I making that point? Um, if we were in a software defined system that you might typically associate with hyperconvergence, where the hypervisor is a co resonant ingredient of software defined in hyperconvergence, we don't have that. Um, in this case, we certainly do a, use a, a Linux based kernel for delivering our software defined infrastructure, but we're not requiring a hypervisor to be inclusive with this. So we just use what, uh, in this case, Amazon provides. Uh, but similar to on-prem, our multi-hypervisor approach or bare metal uh, is capable of then hosting multiple environments, whether you choose one hypervisor or another or bare metal, where there isn't any requirement for a hypervisor, then that's fine. In this
this case, we've got the ability to mix and match those in the on-prem environment. And in the case of AWS, uh, we run right with them on what they're putting into the Nitro infrastructure, uh, in this case, the Zen-based hypervisor. Okay, well, that's uh, that's helpful because we have seen times where release can or release schedules will lag, and for customers that that are uh, you know in a more agile manner, accepting new new updates to uh, their on-prem stuff, you just you'd, you'd like to to match as fast as possible in the cloud. It sounds like that problem has been solved here. Well, it's being the same version, um, the updates uh, again may be uh, p- applicable to certain parts. So. If a release update were being put out by us for uh, setting up a set of maybe um, changes to firmware that's in the network switches or into a PowerEdge server or something like that, obviously wouldn't be necessary for uh, a cloud environment. Those things that are going to get changed that might be applicable to the the PowerFlex layer uh, are released. And again, the same version is being used. So there's no discriminating about whether it's cloud or not. There isn't a quote unquote cloud version. Uh, we did do though some things here as a utility to automate this, and uh, you'll hear more about how we're going to make this a, a universal across the the Dell portfolio direction. But a, a lot of what it is that we enabled customers to do is get this right the first time um, by us having picked all the necessary ingredients out of the possible combinations that you could get wrong in an AWS catalog of instance types, storage types. Um, the purpose of us here is to help our customers get it right, get it right the first time, eliminate variables that could potentially uh, cause a drift in what their user experience is and therefore performance could end up being a detriment if somebody isn't picking the right things. The uh, whole point of us is not letting you get into that kind of trouble. What we did here was to make it so that it was literally could start with zero of anything on uh, being able to pick up what's necessary for the instance types, being able to install the ingredients from a PowerFlex perspective, uh, also going through all the VPC wiring. So your, your virtual private cloud uh, networking is all automated and set up. We're literally leaving you at the time we've been on this call in an infrastructure that can be scaled from whatever capacity you want uh, to a ready to provision volumes um, in this, this time we've been on the call. So automating that whole thing, being able to give you literally only about four questions to answer for you to have that outcome occur, as the experience that we really want customers to enjoy. Uh, how do you get from here to there uh, quickly, easily, and with uh, no errors is the whole objective. So let's talk a little more broadly about Alpine because you started to, to go there a little bit. Um, obviously here you're starting with AWS, biggest cloud, you know, makes, makes a lot of sense. They also have, a, from what I'm told, I'm not a uh, cloud developer, but a uh, a mature API stack that makes it a little easier to to work with uh, in terms of of getting you know your hooks or their hooks or or whatever you know, together to to make things work. What is the Alpine vision, uh, both internationally and across multiple clouds? Yeah, so you think about what we're trying to help our customers do is worry less about all of those APIs that may differ across all of these different platforms. Um, making it such that the customers are relying on us to have worked out those things. So mm-hmm. if at the end of the day, uh, I could simplify it by saying, look, I want 100 terabytes and I need it to be uh, block storage. Um, I should probably be able to say those two things and I'll let you, Dell, take care of the rest. In this case, wire up everything I just mentioned, install it for me, get me to a place where I can then start to do what's necessary, in which is assign a volume to a uh, application and then I'm off to the races. If you are to do it yourself and be able to hand wire all of that, uh, there are a lot of steps and many people potentially are not going to appreciate having to do all of those steps, even if they have the experience of having done it before, um, why require them to do that when we can automate that? So the whole concept here is for us to deliver a provisioning and a lifecycle administration experience that makes this simple for our customers to get to what's important. That's I want to get to business, and business means applications. And so what does that mean then? How does that translate to your expansion, either to other geos or other clouds or, or both, really? What, what, what has to be the emphasis there? Yeah, I think you've seen what we've published before on Alpine's direction, and that is for us to be capable of helping customers with wherever they have chosen to uh, 
if you will, commit to their spending direction. Uh, and that's a reality. Your customers have uh, often picked a, a particular commitment and a cloud vendor for what they're going to use. Now, will they have different preferences? Absolutely. And we recognize the market leadership positions of each of those platforms. So we're here helping our customers to achieve the results regardless of where they prefer. And for customers that want to check this out, what has been the onboarding mechanism to get to a POC? Are you setting up, uh, helping them set up, you know, a specific, a real live uh, instance in AWS? Do you have something else? Uh, I know you obviously have demos and and config videos and all sorts of other stuff. If they really want to get into the weeds, but if I'm thinking about this as an org, what's the what is the easiest path to actually get hands on? Yeah, uh, so we have an outstanding group of sales specialists here that are uh, very well acquainted with what PowerFlex has been doing all along. The cloud environment for them is no different. The whole point is to first have a little bit of a discussion about what is it you want to get out of the implementation. Um, our guidance to them is generally based on what do they say about what they want their workloads to do, how performant they want it to be where they are now, where they want to be, giving them recommendations on how to best practice this. Uh, as I mentioned, we've got flexibility on how this gets done. So part of this is a guided journey through our sales experts to help them with making sure that they get it right. Well, I guess the good news is, is if you want to do a POC on AWS, uh, it shouldn't take long to stand one up, right? That, exactly. That's I mean, exactly a right. heck of a lot faster than you guys shipping them, you know, a bunch of nodes and sitting on the dock bay and getting someone to rack it and provision it. I mean, we've seen how many dozens or, you know, you've seen, I'm sure, hundreds of those POCs die on the vine because they never get set up or operationalized the right way. I mean, this is, it should be that simple. Absolutely. I mean, it, and it usually ends up being after we get you to the point of being able to provision and load your applications, it's mostly in the hands of the customer's ability to install what they're going to do to use the workload. Uh, the length of time it takes for them to go through and doing that is generally going to be longer than, as I say, if taking anywhere around 20 minutes or so to set up a configuration of whatever scale or size that they would like. Uh, means that you know, then it's in the hands of what they want to do with it from an application perspective. Well, it's very cool. Uh, we've got a detailed piece up on the website back from the last week's launch. Um, I know you guys have got a microsite set up. We'll link to that in the description for for this event, uh, for this podcast. So for anyone that wants to check it out, uh, there's plenty of materials. You guys have uh, you've said it a couple times. Dell's gotten really good. Uh, you know, lately, or at least the, the the way I've been paying attention in the last year of creating a ton of marketing and technical uh, information around these solutions, not just for this one, but for all of them. Uh, so there's lots of resources out there. We'll link to a bunch of them in the in the notes. And uh, um, Michael, appreciate the time. Thanks for doing this. Yeah, absolutely. And listen, uh, I would be remiss if I did not mention that part of this is uh, leveraging our inventory of products across the Dell portfolio. Uh, so the visibility into monitoring and uh, what we're doing operationally through Cloud IQ, the, uh, the hygiene our customers should still be following, uh, leverages uh, the domain virtual edition, which is already in uh, the AWS platform for people that want to do their backup and do it uh, with extreme data efficiency and cost efficiency, which allows them to write this to S3. All have been tested and converged into options that customers can hopefully take advantage of. All right, well, you got those last plugs in. That's good. <laughs> Thanks again for doing this. And uh, uh, it's great. Uh, we're, we're looking forward to seeing more and uh, seeing where you guys take all of these uh, Alpine services. Great, as am I. Thank you. Appreciate your time, Brian.